Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, author, theosophist, occultist, explorer, and much more. A woman who had a profound impression on people's beliefs and lives, forever changing society. Born August 12, 1831, in Dnipro, Russian Ukraine, to Captain Peter Hahn and Yelena Hahn. Peter was a captain of a group of horse artillery. Her mother was a self-educated woman and novelist. Her mother's health was often poor, and due to this, she had a very mobile childhood, as well as from her father's career. Early on, she and her mother moved to Ostrakhan, and due to her mother becoming a trustee to the Kalmyk people, here Helena first encountered Tibetan Buddhism. In 1838, they moved to Potava. Helena's mother taught her piano and dance here, but due to her mother's health again, they moved to Odessa, being taught English here by a British governess, apparently. After this for a time, they visited her mother's parents in Saratov. Her grandfather was governor here, having many intellectuals visit during their stay. Soon returning to Odessa, Yelena, her mother, aged 28, died of tuberculosis in June of 1842, moving back in with her grandparents in Saratov. At this age, she was already a storyteller, and her relatives said she preferred to associate with the lower class, seeing that, that to relate more with them than the upper, with some of her favorite activities being pranks as well as reading. Helena was now being educated in French, art, and music, all to find her a husband later in life. She was a splendid piano player, artist, and sculptor. Helena would summer camp with her grandparents in the Tumens Kalmyk summer camp, while the camp at camp, she was taught horseback riding and some Tibetan. She claimed in her grandparents' home, she discovered the library of her great-great-grandfather containing books on esoteric subjects. Her great-great-grandfather was a Freemason who allegedly met Alejandro Calistro and Count St. Germain. Around this time, she began seeing the visions of a mysterious Indian man calling him her protector, saving her several times and in 1844, her father brought her to England, visiting London and Bath, supposedly becoming a pupil of Moscheles. After living with her aunt for a year in Georgia, at the age of 16, claiming to befriend Alexander Golostin, a Russian Freemason who encouraged her esoteric fascination, she claims to have had paranormal experiences, more mysterious visions, and even astral traveling. On July 7, 1849, she married N.V. Blavatsky. She was 17, he was in his 40s. She claimed that she was attracted to his belief in magic. It was planned for her to return after the wedding to St. Petersburg. However, Helena had her own plans, making her way to Constantinople, being her the beginning of her 20 years of travel going around the world three times. N.V. tried to divorce but Russia's current views on divorce stopped this from happening, legally being married until their passings. During this time, we have to keep in mind that at this age, she never kept a journal, and these are Helena's own accounts later in life, so they may not be 100% true. Her father was the only person who knew where she was, periodically sending her money. While still in Constantinople, she became acquainted with opera singer Agardi Mitrovich, supposedly saving him from a murder. She also met Countess Sofia Kisilyova, accompanying her to Egypt, Greece, and Eastern Europe, first to Cairo, where she met American art student Albert Rawson. Together, they would visit the Coptic magician Paulos Metamon. By 1851, she made it to Paris, having an encounter with mesmerist Victor Michael, who she said impressed her, and from there she went to England claiming to meet the man from her visions, who she described as a Hindu named Master Moria, which occurred on her birthday in Hyde Park. Master Moria had a mission for Helena, which would have her travel to Tibet. Before the journey to Asia, she would stop in North America, and by autumn 1851 she had made it to Canada, seeking out native communities in Quebec to see their spiritual masters. Instead, though, she was robbed, saying the natives who had robbed her were corrupted by Christianity. From here, she ventured south, first to New Orleans, Texas, Mexico, and finally 
the Andes, then aboard a transport ship to India, stopping in Ceylon, modern-day Sri Lanka. Upon arriving, she attempted to enter Tibet, but was stopped from doing so by the British colonial administration. After spending two years in India, she returned to Europe, going by ship which crashed around Cape Good Hope, before arriving in England in 1854. Here, she faced hostility due to being Russian and the ongoing Crimean War. During this time, she worked as a musician in the Royal Philharmonic Society, and soon she sailed to the U.S., visiting New York City, meeting with Rawson, the artist from Cairo. Here, many members of the Tile Club would visit, but then she was off to Chicago, Salt Lake City, and San Francisco, going back to India, but stopping in Japan first. In India, she spent time in Kashmir, Ladakh, and Burma, soon trying to enter Tibet a second time, apparently being successful, because she was accompanied by a Tartar shaman going to Siberia. However, before reaching Leh, they became lost, having to join a traveling group back to India. Deciding after a failed attempt, she went back to Europe from Madras, first to Germany, then France, back to her family in Piscov. Here, her abilities became more active, having many things happen like rapping, odd sounds, and furniture moving around the house, apparently. In 1860, she reunited with Mitrovich, and two years later, she reconciled with her husband, adopting a child together, who sadly passed at the age of five in 1867, buried under the name Mitrovich, though. At the age of 33, in 1864, she fell off a horse going into a coma for months, recovering in Georgia, and upon awakening, Helena would have full control of her abilities. She then traveled to Italy, Transylvania, Serbia, studying the Kabbalah with a rabbi who had done so for 30 years. After her child's passing, she ventured to the Balkans, Hungary, and again to Italy. She claimed while in Italy she was injured in the Battle of Matana, supposedly fighting Giuseppe Garibaldi. Soon she received a letter from Master Moria to travel to Constantinople, and after meeting, they would travel to Tibet, going through Turkey, Persia, Afghanistan, then to India, reaching Tibet through Kashmir. Once in Tibet, they stayed in the home of Master Kuthumi, near the Tashilhampo Monastery. Kuthumi had taught Buddhism from his home. Kuthumi himself had traveled to London and Leipzig, speaking both English and French. Both masters were also vegetarians. She was taught an ancient unknown language, preserved by the monastery's monks, supposedly. While in Tibet, Morian Kuthumi helped her develop and control her psychic powers. Among the abilities that were ascribed to these masters were clairvoyance, clairaudience, telepathy, and the ability to control another's consciousness, to dematerialize and rematerialize physical objects, and to project their astral bodies, thus giving the appearance of being in two places at once. This being between 1868 and 1870, she claimed to have gone to places no other Europeans had gone, though we don't truly know if this happened. On November 11th, her aunt received a letter from Master Kathumi that Helena would return soon, leaving Tibet to prove spiritual phenomena was indeed real. First to Greece, meeting Master Hilarion, then to Egypt aboard the SS Eunomia in 1871, during this journey, the ship exploded due to a powder magazine it was carrying, having only 16 survivors. In Cairo, she met with Metamon, as well as with Emma Cutting, who would loan her money. Together, they established the short-lived Societe Spirite, a form of spiritualism founded by Alan Kardec, believing in reincarnation. She shut it down after two weeks, believing what the mediums employed was fraudulent. During this time, she met Egyptologist Gasto Maspero, as well as another master, Serapis Bey. Her longtime friend, Mitrovich, sadly passed in this time due to typhoid, and she saw over his funeral. She went from Egypt to Syria, Palestine, and Lebanon, where she encountered the Druze. We have verification of this because of Lydia Pashkova's diary, who she met at this time, and in July of 1872, she was in Odessa with her family, 
and by April 1873 she departed to Bucharest, then Paris where she was instructed to go to New York, reaching New York City on July 8, 1873, moving into a woman's housing co-op in Manhattan's Lower East Side, earning money through sewing and designing cards. She got the attention of journalist Anna Bollard, with Anna's interview being the earliest source of Helena's time in Tibet that we have. Her father passed during this time, leaving her an inheritance. She then moved into a luxury hotel. She saw an article on William and Horatio Eddy, two brothers from Chittenden, Vermont, who claimed to levitate and manifest phenomena. In October of 1874, she met with reporter Henry Still Olcott, who was investigating the claims. Olcott wrote an article on Helena being impressed with her abilities in commanding the elementals. They soon became close friends, even giving each other nicknames like Maloney and Jack. Helena wrote People of the Other World, giving an interview on it from the Daily Graphic, and Alexander As Asakov urged a Russian translation. Together, Helena and Olcott published the circular letter the spiritual scientist, naming themselves the Brotherhood of Luxor. Together they would move into several New York City apartments. They also formed a club to investigate the paranormal, being called the Miracle Club. But it was ended due to a medium wanting to use it as a way to make money. Their apartments would be decorated with the art of spiritual figures and taxidermied animals, mainly being funded by Olcott's job as a lawyer. Through the club, they met spiritualist William Judge, and the club held a meeting on the September 7th, having a discussion on forming an esoteric organization. Charles Sutherland suggested calling it the Theosophical Society. It was insisted on that it was not to be a religion, and Al Olcott was made president, G.H. Felt and Dr. Seth Pancoast vice president, Judge the council, and Helena the corresponding secretary, but being the leading figure, all to be instructed by the masters. Olcott gave his inaugural speech on November 17th, with early prominent members being Emma Bitton, C.C. Macy, William Alden, and even Thomas Edison. In 1875, she began on a book on the theosophical worldview, writing in the Ithaca home of Hiram Corson. Hiram was an author and professor of English at Cornell, this book was to be Isis unveiled. She claimed while writing she had a second consciousness in her, and Olcott says that she quoted from books she had never read before, with writer Gary Lockman saying this was edic memory. The book was a mix of ideas that had never been done before, being a critical response to materialism, as well as the belief that most religion stemmed from an ancient wisdom, and to be connected with hermeticism and neoplatism. She also made a critique on Darwin's evolution theory for only dealing with the physical evolution while ignoring sp spiritual evolution. The book was published in two volumes in 1877 by J.U. Boughton. It faced negative reviews, but still sold its 1,000 copies in a week. The publisher requested a sequel, but she denied it. In 1876, Theosophical Lodges were open in the U.S. and London. And by July 8, 1878, she had gained U.S. citizenship, being the first Russian woman to ever do so. The Theosophical Society had established links with a Hindu reform movement, the Arya Samaj, which had been founded by the Swami Dayananda Saraswati. Blavatsky and Olcott believed that the two organizations shared a common spiritual worldview. She became unhappy living in the U.S., so her and Olcott auctioned off their possessions and moved to India. Before so, Edison had gifted them a phonograph for their journey. They arrived in Bombay on February 16, 1879, greeted with a celebration by the Arya Samaj. They got a house on Gurgam Road. She would be active in the local community, have having a 15-year-old as her personal servant, Babula. Many Indian scholars began taking an interest in theosophy, and she began being surveilled by the British intelligence services, suspecting her of working for Russia. In April, her and Ol 
Olcott, Babula, and a few other friends went to the Karla Caves, saying it contained secret passages to an underground palace built by the masters. She then claimed to be telepathically instructed to go to Radputan, so her and Olcott went north. When reaching the Yamuna River, she, they there met Sanyasin Babu Sardas, who had sat in a lotus position for 52 years. They then saw the Taj Mahal. Upon returning to Bombay, the two worked on the magazine The Theosophist, with the first issue coming in October. It grew fast in popularity, being managed by Damandar Mavlankar, who introduced calling the masters the Mahatmas, and by December she was in Allahabad visiting Alfred Sennett, editor of The Pioneer and a spiritualist. She encouraged Sennett to manifest parent paranormal phenomena. In Senate's book, The Occult World, he stated that he was impressed by her paranormal miracles. She'd perform. From here, she went to Benares, staying at the palace of Maharaja. Later, she and Olcott were invited to Ceylon by the monks there. The two of them converted to Buddhism, possibly being the first Americans to do so. While here, they were shown the Buddha's tooth and May 19, 1880, they both, both took the five precepts in ceremony. The locals were said to be curious of the outsiders who had converted. And around this time, her friend Emma Colum and her husband had fallen into poverty. So she allowed them to stay in her Bombay home. Two theosophists, though, were said to have taken a disliking to Emma so much, they decided to move back to the U.S. Helena then was invited by Senate to come perform her abilities to his guests. It is said she once made a cup and saucer appear beneath the soil during a picnic. Senate wanted contact with the masters, one time even convincing her to facilitate it, resulting in a 1,400-page work supposedly authored by Master Kuth Kuthumi and Moria, to then be summarized by Senate in the book Esoteric Buddhism in 1883. Scholars and Helena criticize this due to its lack of actual Buddhist material. Some even say Helena was the true author. Theosophy soon became disliked by the Christians and the British BCA. India's English publications were critical to the society, but none of this stopped it from growing popular with the Indian locals. As funds grew, they moved to an elite neighborhood, Breach Candy, being referred to as the Crow's Nest. This location was chosen for being more accessible to Western guests. Soon Helena fell ill with Bright's disease, making her decide to go to the society's Madra branch for its better weather. Bright's disease inflames the kidney, leading to, in some cases, the hardening of the kidney. In November 1882, the society purchased an estate in Adyar, being made the permanent headquarters, with several rooms just for Helena. Moving in by December 19th, it said that when she first saw this estate, she stated, The masters want this purchased. She and Olcott soon left India for London, where Olcott was to make an argument for the Silanese Buddhism. They were also there to sort out problems in the London Lodge. The roles for the residents of this lodge were First, the latest time for rising in the morning during all seasons of the year is 8 o'clock. Two, breakfast must be concluded at 9 a.m., which at the hour the table will be cleared. All lights must be turned out before going to bed, both in sitting rooms and bedrooms, must be turned down or extinguished when not in use. Four, all lights must be out by midnight, special arrangements being made in exception, exceptional cases. 5. The bathroom must not be used between 11.30 and 6 a.m. 6. Members may invite friends to share the common meals, giving written notice to the housekeeper on the slips provided for the purpose and paying one for breakfast, lunch, or tea, and a sixth for dinner. Visitors must leave by 11.30 p.m. and all gas be extinguished and doors locked by 11.45 and finally, seven, members must, in the morning, notify of the book provided for the purpose intended absences for meals. 
After 10 p.m., any member requiring tea or coffee must make or warm it for himself on the gas stove in the back kitchen. In March of 1883, she sailed to France to visit with the founder of their French branch, also spending time in Paris. In London, she appeared at the Lodges meeting, where she sought to quell arguments between Senate on the one hand and Anna Kingsford and Edward Maitland on the other. Unsatisfied Kingsford, whom Blavatsky thought an unbearably snobbish woman, split from the Theosophical Society to f form the Hermetic Society. While in London, she contacted the Society for Physical Research through Frederick Myers to research her abilities. However, she was unimpressed with her study, calling it a spookical research society. And at this time, trouble arose in India's Adyar branch, being known as the Column Affair. The Society's Board of Control had accused Emma Colum of misappropriating their funds for her own purposes and asked her to leave their center. She and her husband refused, blackmailing the Society with letters that claimed were written by Blavatsky and which proved that her paranormal abilities were fraudulent. The Society refused to pay them and expelled them from their premises, at which the couple turned to the Madras-based Christian College magazine, who published an expose of Blavatsky's alleged fraudulence using the column's claims as a basis. The story attracted international attention and was picked up by the London-based newspaper The Times. In response, in November of 1884, Blavatsky headed to Cairo, where she and theosophist Charles Webster led lead beater searched for negative information on Emma Colum discovering stories of her alleged former history of extortion and criminality. Internally, the society was greatly damaged by the Colum affair, although it remained popular in India as far as did Blavatsky herself. They left for India on November 1st, arriving December 17th, leaving in March 1885, and by this time there was 221 lodges, 106 of those were in India, Ceylon, and Burma. At first, each lodge was chartered directly from the Adyar headquarters, with members making democratic decisions by vote. However, over the coming years, the lodges were organized into national units with their own ruling councils, resulting in tensions between the different levels of administration. In April, they settled in Tor de Greco in Italy, living on the society's pension, to then travel to Warsburg, Bavaria, where she worked on the secret doctrine which was originally meant to be in monthly installments. While here, she was visited by Constance Wachmeister, who would later become a companion of hers. Here, her health also got better, making her more active. And, de and in December of 1885, the SPR published their report on Blavatsky and her alleged phenomena, authored by Richard Hodgson. In this report, Hodgson accused Blavatsky of being a spy for the Russian government, further accusing her of faking paranormal phenomena largely on the base of, basis of Colum's claims. The report caused much tension within the society, with a number of Blavatsky's followers, among them being Babaji and Subaro, denouncing her and resigning from the organization on the basis of it. Helena wished to sue, but Olcott advised against it, worried it would damage the society. But a hundred years later, the SPR retracted the report, and by 1886, she was using a wheelchair and was frequently visiting Belgium. In March of 1887, she fell greatly ill, having William Ellis treat her. She credited him and Master Moria for saving her life, stating Moria offered to take her from, her, from the suffering. And soon she opened an ink-producing business, and at this time the London Lodge disliked Senate's running of it, believing he had a preference to the upper class, treating them better. And on May 1st, 1887, Helena began staying with Mabel Collins, and by September, she was staying in the home of Bertram Knightley and his nep nephew Archibald in Holland Park. With her legs paralyzed, she would refer to herself as glorified luggage. Helena decided to open her own lodge in London in retaliation of Senate's quickly draining its members. She would hold meetings in Knightley's home, greeting all who came, with even William Yates visiting. In November of 1889, she was visited by Mohandas Gandhi, who was studying with Knightley, later becoming a member of her lodge. The year prior, in October of 1888, the esoteric sect of theosophy began, 
only open to those who completed tests run by Helena. This was only for true theosophists, studying its teachings of spiritual practice based on theosophy's principles. She also founded the controversial magazine Lucifer, focusing on philosophy. The Secret Doctrine was also completed at this time, being edited by Knightley, and to publish this book, they established the Theosophy Publishing Company, being published in two volumes, first October 88, the second in January of 89. It contained her commentary on the book of Pizian, taught to her in Tibet, though there is no proof of this book ever existing. It was also her, on her own beliefs and theories. In August of 1890, she moved in with Annie Besant, a social reformer, who reviewed the volumes, being impressed by them, and in July, Annie's home was made the HQ for the European branches, Annie being made the head of the lodge. The same month, U.S. newspaper The Sun published accusations made by former member Elliot Coves. Helena sued, and the article was retracted a year after her passing. During this time, she wrote two books, The Key of Theosophy and The Voice of Silence, a book on a senzar, the book of golden precepts, which may also not exist. In August of 1890 as well was the formation of the inner group, holding a meeting in the HQ in a specially designed room for it. It was a kind of Q&A with Helena, and by the winter of 1890, an influenza epidemic had hit London, and by April, Helena and most of the HQ had caught it as well. She got a high fever on April 25th, but seeming to improve by May 6th, passing sadly at 2.25 p.m. on May 8th. She was seated in her chair surrounded by friends and the inner group members. Helena had left instructions that no parade or show of any kind should be made over her body. Her body was cremated at Woking Crematorium in Surrey on May 11, 1891. G.R.S. Meade, General Secretary of the European Section and Helena's private secretary, addressed a small assembly of officers, staff, and friends. And then the ashes were returned to her own rooms. Between May 8th and 9th, Olcott had received three distinct warnings about her passing. He had received a cablegram about the fact on May 10th, and on July 9th, 1891, the first annual convention of the European branches was held in London, with William Judge offered a resolution for the creation of an HPB memorial fund. And Olcott, as chairman, suggested the partitions of Helena's ashes. Some of the ashes are buried under the Blavatsky and Olcott statues in the Adyar headquarters that they had established in 1882. This day has now become known to theosophists as White Lotus Day. She was said to be a short, stout, and determined woman who tended to be untidy living a somewhat simple life, smoking cigarettes and occasionally enjoying hash. She abided by her own beliefs, being an imaginative storyteller with a temper, hating oppression and colonialism. She held the belief of the root races and believed ancient wisdom persisted in India and Africa and that we consisted of seven parts Atma, Buddhi, Mana, Kama, Linga Sharira, Prana, and Satula Sharira. Goodrick Clark noted that Blavatsky's cosmology contained all four of the prime characteristics of ancient esotericism that had been identified by the scholar Anthony Favre. First, the correspondences between all parts of the universe, the macrocosm and the microcosm. Second, the living nature as a complex, plural, hierarchical, and animate whole. Three, the imagination and meditations in the form of intermediary spirit symbols and mandalas. And the existence of transmutation of the soul through purification and ascent. Historian Ronald Hutton would call her one of the century's truly international figures. And in 2006, scholar James A. Santushi noted that she was as visible today as any modern trend-setting guru, and she will most likely remain the most memorable and innovative esotericist of the 19th century, though she did not want to be worshipped. And Mabel Collins, after leaving the movement, she said, She taught me one great lesson. I learned from her how foolish, how gullible, how easily flattered human beings are, taken in mass. Her contempt for her kind was on the same gigantic scale as everything else about her, except her marvelously delicate tapered fingers. In all else, she was a big woman. She had a greater power over the weak and credulous, 
a greater capacity for making black appear white, a large waist, a more voracious appetite, a more confirmed passion for tobacco, a more senseless and insati insatiable hatred for those she thought to be her enemies, a greater disrespect for less conveniences, a worse temper, a greater command for bad language, and a great contempt for the intelligence of her fellow beings that I had ever supposed possible to be con contained in one person. These, I suppose, must be reckoned as her vices, though in whether a creature so indifferent to all ordinary standards of right and wrong can be held to have virtues or vices, I know not. She de-emphasized gender, and one cannot deny the impact she made upon occultism and the New Age movements. She made an even larger impact in the East with promoting local religious roots and the growth of India's national independence movement, as well as many Buddhist movements. She brought much Eastern philosophy and belief to the West, believing that it would solve the West problems. And this has been the life and impact of Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Thank you for watching today's video, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what topic you would like me to do next and it may be my next video.